Section fourteen of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter twenty seven. Reginald Clark had hardly left the room when Ernest hastily rose from his seat. While it was likely that he would remain in undisturbed possession of the apartment the whole morning, the stake at hand was too great to permit of delay. Palpitating and a little uncertain, he entered the studio, where, scarcely a year ago, Reginald Clark had bidden him welcome. Nothing had changed there since then. Only in Ernest's mind the room had assumed an aspect of evil. The Antinous was there, and the Fawn, the Christhead. But their juxtaposition to-day partook of the nature of the blasphemous. The statues of Shakespeare and Balzac seemed to frown from their pedestals as his fingers were running through Reginald's papers. He brushed against a semblance of Napoleon that was standing on the writing-table, so that it toppled over and made a noise that weirdly re-echoed in the silence of the room. At that moment a curious family resemblance between Shakespeare, Balzac, Napoleon, and Reginald, forcefully impressed itself upon his mind. It was the indisputable something that marks those who were chosen to give ultimate expression to some gigantic world purpose. In Balzac's face it was diffused with kindliness and that of Napoleon sheer brutality predominated. The image of one who was said to be the richest man of the world also rose before his eyes. Perhaps it was only the play of his fevered imagination, but he could have sworn that this man's features too bore the mark of those unoriginal great absorptive minds, who for better or for worse are born to rob and rule. They seemed to him monsters that know neither justice nor pity, only the law of their being, the law of growth. Common weapons would not avail against such forces. Being one, they were stronger than armies, nor could they be overcome in single combat. Stealth, trickery, the outfit of the knave, were legitimate weapons in such a fight. In this case the end justified the means, even if the latter included burglary. After a brief and fruitless search of the desk, he attempted to force open a secret drawer, the presence of which he had one day accidentally discovered. He tried a number of keys to no account, and was thinking of giving up his researches for the day until he had procured a skeleton key, when at last the lock gave way. The drawer disclosed a large file of manuscript. Ernest paused for a moment to draw breath. The paper rustled under his nervous fingers. And there, at last, his eyes lit upon a bulky bundle that bore this legend, Leontina, a novel. It was true, then, all his dream, Reginald's confession, and the house that had opened its doors so kindly to him was the house of a vampire. Finally curiosity overcame his burning indignation. He attempted to read. The letters seemed to dance before his eyes. His hands trembled. At last he succeeded. The words that had first rolled over like drunken soldiers now marched before his vision in orderly sequence. He was delighted, then stunned. This was indeed authentic literature, there could be no doubt about it, and it was his. He was still a poet, a great poet. He drew a deep breath. Sudden joy trembled in his heart. This story set down by a foreign hand had grown chapter by chapter in his brain. There were some slight changes, slight deviations from the original plan. A defter hand than his had retouched it here and there, but for all that it remained his very own. It did not belong to that thief. The blood welled to his cheek as he uttered the word that, applied to Reginald, seemed almost sacrilegious. He had nearly reached the last chapter when he heard steps in the hallway. Hurriedly he restored the manuscript to its place, closed the drawer, and left the room on tiptoe. It was Reginald. But he did not come alone. Someone was speaking to him. The voice seemed familiar. Ernest could not make out what it said. He listened intently, and— was it possible? Jack? Surely he could not yet have come in response to his note. What mysterious power, what dim presentiment of his friend's plight had led him thither? But why did he linger so long in Reginald's room instead of hastening to greet him? Cautiously he drew near. This time he caught Jack's words. It would be convenient and pleasant. Still some way I feel that it is not right for me, of all men, to take his place here. That need not concern you. Reginald deliberately replied. The dear boy expressed the desire to leave me within a fortnight. I think he will go to some private sanitarium. His nerves are frightfully overstrained. 
This seems hardly surprising after the terrible attack he had when you read your play. That idea has since then developed into a monomania. I am awfully sorry for him. I cared for him much, perhaps too much, but I always feared that he would come to such an end. Of late his letters have been strangely unbalanced. You will find him very much changed. In fact, he is no longer the same." No, said Jack, he is no longer the friend I loved. Ernest clutched for the wall. His face was contorted with intense agony. Each word was like a nail driven into his flesh, crucified upon the cross of his own affection by the hand he loved, all white and trembling he stood there. Tears rushed to his eyes, but he could not weep. Dry-eyed he reached his room and threw himself upon his bed. Thus he lay, uncomforted and alone. CHAPTER Twenty Eight. Terrible as was his loneliness, a meeting with Jack would have been more terrible. And after all it was true, a gulf had opened between them. Ethel alone could bring solace to his soul. There was a great void in his heart which only she could fill. He hungered for the touch of her hand. He longed for her presence strongly, as a wanton lusts for pleasure, and as sad men crave death. Noiselessly he stole to the door so as not to arouse the attention of the other two men, whose every whisper pierced his heart like a dagger. When he came to Ethel's home he found that she had gone out for a breath of air. The servant ushered him into the parlour, and there he waited, waited, waited for her. Greatly calmed by his walk, he turned the details of Clark's conversation over in his mind, and the conviction grew upon him that the friend of his boyhood was not to blame for his course of action. Reginald probably had encircled Jack's soul with his demonical influence and singled him out for another victim. That must never be. It was his turn to save now. He would warn his friend of the danger that threatened him, even if his words should be spoken into the wind. For Reginald, with an ingenuity almost satanic, had already suggested that the delusion of former days had developed into a monomania, and any attempt on his part to warn Jack would only seem to confirm this theory. In that case only one way was left open. He must plead with Reginald himself, confront at all risks that snatcher of souls. To-night he would not fall asleep, he would keep his vigil, and if Reginald should approach his room, if in some way he felt the direful presence, he must speak out, threaten if need be, to save his friend from ruin. He had fully determined upon this course when a cry of joy from Ethel, who had just returned from her walk, interrupted his reverie but her gladness changed to anxiety when she saw how pale he was. Ernest recounted to her the happenings of the day, from the discovery of his novel in Reginald's desk to the conversation which he had accidentally overheard. He noticed that her features brightened as he drew near the end of his tale. "'Was your novel finished?' she suddenly asked. "'I think so.' "'Then you are out of danger. He will want nothing else of you. But you should have taken it with you.' I had only sufficient presence of mind to slip it back into the drawer. To-morrow I shall simply demand it. You will do nothing of the kind. It is in his handwriting, and you have no legal proof that it is yours. You must take it away secretly, and he will not dare to reclaim it." And Jack? She had quite forgotten Jack. Women are invariably selfish for those they love. You must warn him, she replied. He would laugh at me. However, I must speak to Reginald. It is of no avail to speak to him. At least you must not do so before you have obtained the manuscript. It would unnecessarily jeopardize our plans." "'And after?' "'After, perhaps. But you must not expose yourself to any danger.' "'No, dear,' he said, and kissed her. "'What danger is there, provided I keep my wits about me? He steals upon men only in their sleep and in the dark. Be careful, nevertheless." "'I shall. In fact, I think he is not at home at this moment. If I go now I may be able to get hold of the manuscript and hide it before he returns. I cannot but tremble to think of you in that house. You shall have no more reason to tremble in a day or two. Shall I see you to-morrow? I don't think so. I must go over my papers and things, so as to be ready at any moment to leave the house. And then? Then? He took her in his arms and looked long and deeply into her eyes. Yes, she replied. At least— Perhaps. Then he turned to go, resolute and happy. How strangely he had matured since the summer! Her heart swelled with the consciousness that it was her love that had effected this transformation. As I cannot expect you to-morrow, I shall probably go to the opera, but I shall be home before midnight. Will you call me up then? 
A word from you will put me at ease for the night, even if it comes over the telephone. I will call you up. We moderns have an advantage over the ancients in this respect. The twentieth century Pyramus can speak to Thisbe, even if innumerable walls sever his body from hers. A quaint conceit! But let us hope that our love story will end less tragically," she said, tenderly caressing his hair. Oh, we shall be happy, you and I," she added after a while. The iron finger of fate that lay so heavily on our lives is now withdrawn, almost withdrawn. Yes, almost, only almost. And then a sudden fear came over her. No, she cried, do not go, do not go. Stay with me, stay here. I feel so frightened. I don't know what comes over me. I am afraid, afraid for you." "'No, dear,' he rejoined, "'you need not be afraid. In your heart you don't want me to desert a friend, and besides leave the best part of my artistic life in Reginald's clutch. Why should you expose yourself to God knows what danger for a friend who is ready to betray you? You forget friendship is a gift. If it exacts payment in any form it is no longer either friendship or a gift. And you yourself have assured me that I have nothing to fear from Reginald. I have nothing to give to him." She rallied under his words, and had regained her self-possession, when the door closed behind him. He walked a few blocks very briskly. Then his pace slackened. Her words had unsettled him a little, and when he reached home he did not at once resume his exploration of Reginald's papers. He had hardly lit a cigarette, when, at an unusually early hour, he heard Reginald's key in the lock. Quickly he turned the light out, and in the semi-darkness, lit up by an electric lantern below, barricaded the door as on the previous night. Then he went to bed without finding sleep. Supreme silence reigned over the house. Even the elevator had ceased to run. Ernest's brain was all ear. He heard Reginald walking up and down in the studio. Not the smallest movement escaped his attention. Thus hours passed. When the clock struck twelve he was still walking up and down, down and up up and down. One o'clock. Still the measured beat of his footfall had not ceased. There was something hypnotic in the regular tread. Nature at last exacted its toll from the boy. He fell asleep. Hardly had he closed his eyes when again that horrible nightmare, no longer a nightmare, tormented him. Again he felt the pointed, delicate fingers carefully feeling their way along the innumerable tangled threads of nerve matter that lead to the innermost recesses of self. A subconscious something strove to arouse him, and he felt the fingers softly withdrawn. He could have sworn that he heard the scurrying of feet in the room. Bathed in perspiration, he made a leap for the electric light. But there was no sign of any human presence. The barricade at the door was undisturbed but fear like a great wind filled the wings of his soul. Yet there was nothing, nothing to warrant his conviction that Reginald Clark had been with him only a few moments ago, plying his horrible trade. The large mirror above the fireplace only showed him his own face, white, excited, the face of a madman. End of section 14